Sempre he viscut a Nova York, però bona part de la meva vida vaig anar a la ciutat de la mateixa manera que l'anelaria algú nascut en una petita població, frisós per anar a la capital. Créixer al Bronx era com créixer en un poble. Des dels primers anys de l'adolescència vaig saber que hi havia una ciutat que era el centre del món i que jo n'era lluny. Al mateix temps, també sabia que aquell lloc només era a unes quantes parades de metro de casa, al downtown de Manhattan. Manhattan era Aràbia. La meva relació amb la mare no és bona i a mesura que anem acumulant anys sembla que encara empitjora. Sempre que em veu em diu, tu m'ho dies, sé que m'ho dies. Vaig a veure-la i diu a qualsevol que llegi a casa seva, un veí, un amic, el meu germà, una de les meves nebodes. M'ho dia, no sé què té en contra meu, però m'ho dia. També és ben capaç d'aturar un desconegut al carrer quan passegem i dir, aquesta és la meva filla, m'ho dia. Aleshores, se'm dirigeix a mi i em diu en un to de súplica «Què t'he fet perquè m'ho diguis tant?». Jo no responc mai. Sé que ella crema per dins i no em fa res deixar que cremi. Per què no? Jo també cremo per dins. Altre cop el vaig mirar de ple, però aquesta mirada va ser diferent de les altres. Un home em pressionava perquè fes una cosa que no volia fer i em pressionava com no ho hauria fet mai a un altre home, dient-me que no sabia el que volia. Vaig sentir com els ulls se m'empetitien i com el cor se'm refredava. Per primera vegada, però no l'última, vaig sentir conscientment que els homes eren membres d'una espècie aliena a mi, aliena i desconeguda. Summer journeys to Niagara and to other places aggravate all our cares. We'll save our fares. I've a cozy little pad in what is known as Old Manhattan. We'll settle down right here. Oh, it's yours. Are you okay? Good. Good to be here. Eh, bona tarda, eh, gràcies a tots per ser aquí. Thank you so much for being My here, pleasure. Vivian. Mm -hmm. uh, jo crec que si sou aquí ja la coneixeu, no necessita massa presentació, però he pactat amb ella que diria un parell de coses per si algú ha vingut a interessar-se per ella per primera vegada. Um, la Vivian va començar el, fent periodisme a Village Voice. Va ser aquí precisament on va descobrir el feminisme, estem parlant dels anys 70, es va dedicar també molt a la crítica, era una crítica bastant ferotge, bastant, bastant respectada, considerada una de les assagistes més importants dels Estats Units, tot i que a ella li agrada més parlar de narrativa personal. Aquí s'han publicat un parell de, de memòries seves, eh, Vincles ferotges, que és de l'any 87, i de l'any 2015, La dona singular i la ciutat. Ens hi parla de moltíssimes coses, d'ella, de la ciutat, d'aquest Bronx, de Manhattan, de la relació amb la seva mare, una relació com a mínim particular, per dir-ho d'alguna manera, de la relació també amb el seu pare, que va morir quan ella només tenia 13 anys, d'escriptura, de feminisme, dels seus matrimonis, s'ha casat dues vegades, cap de les dues vegades va funcionar, i ella ho explica també molt obertament. I comencem parlant about um, fierce attachments, which I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is your favorite book. The first yes, it is, actually. Yes. Mm -hmm. you, want, you want me to say that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> if it's okay with you, I can change the fine, question. Okay. It's fine. Um, Fierce Attachments was uh, the book that uh, sort of ended my apprenticeship as a writer in the sense that it was the first time <clears throat> I ever felt as if I stood directly in the middle of the circle of experience and I could look all around and I understood it all. I understood my mother, I understood me, I understood everything that I felt that way. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I felt that way and I, I don't think I've ever, ever written another book in which I had that feeling. Mm -hmm. So for better or for worse, it's my favorite book. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think you just reread it like a month ago? Yes, Since I did. Since 1987? Yes, I wow. know, I'm, in all these years, I wrote the book 30 years ago and I never read it until I was coming here <laughs> to see what all the fuss was about. <laughs> <laughs> and I was amazed to read it 
I thought, gee, this is really good. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> believe I wrote it. <laughs> I was amazed at how much I had to say. <laughs> I'm sure that happens a lot to writers. I know it does. Um, you often read something you wrote many years ago and think, um, you, 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 you think exactly what I thought was, my God, I was good then. I can't, I can't, I can't imagine I'm still that good. <laughs> I think every single book, one feels a break with what one has known or not known, or mm -hmm. it's a very strange profession. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that mm -hmm. after reading you, I wouldn't say that you are the person in the world with the with the biggest self confidence. Mm -hmm. So I was surprised by you by oh, you yeah? saying this is really a great book, <laughs> but then oh, you no, suddenly no. said, "Yeah, I probably don't write as well as I did then." <laughs> right. So, <laughs> Right. So, well, that's the reality. <laughs> you still feel that oh, when you write? No, I don't, I don't think in those terms anymore. Um, you can't. You really can't. You, just, you would just be hobbling yourself if you did. Uh, no, I never, I never think about how well or how badly I write now. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just do it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. when, you, when you started writing this book, I think that you first started really quickly, and then when you had like 40 pages, you got stuck? Yes, yes. What happened? Right, okay, <laughs> right. Um, Fierce Attachments has an odd structure. It's, um, I started to, uh, to write the book, I'm gonna look at the audience, okay? Yeah, of course, please. Because <laughs> that's what we really have to do here. Uh, I started to write the book, this book, I wanted to tell the story of my mother and myself and a woman who lived next door to us in this tenement building in a working class neighborhood in the Bronx when I was a child. Um, I wrote about 30, 40, 50 pages and I uh, got stuck. I, I somehow was not able to go forward. And one of the reasons I was not able to go forward I told the story the other night, right? Yeah. Okay. Was that I, um, I had a lot of unfinished business with my mother. She was alive uh, when I was writing. And I had all this unfinished business and I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to integrate it into the story, that the perfectly conventional story that was being told about childhood. And then one day my mother, who was herself quite a character, called me up and said something happened at the, at the street corner. She'd been at the corner, ready to cross the street, and a little girl was standing next to her, and the little girl started to cross the street on the red light. And my mother pulled her back and said, sweetheart, you only cross on the green. And the little girl said to my mother, lady, you have the whole thing upside down. <laughs> and my mother said to me, that kid is not gonna live to eight. <laughs> and I enjoyed the story and I thought, I'm so miserable now, not able to go on writing this book, I'm gonna write, just gonna write down this little story. Then I realized the only way to make it matter at all was to set it up, which is what a writer has to do. Otherwise, it would just be an anecdote floating in space. So I did set it up by talking, uh, by writing about how Mama and I walk all the time in the city and what these walks do for us, how much we're able to, um, no matter how bad things ever become between us, we're able to ameliorate uh, wh whatever uh, is negative between us when we walk. The city and the, the theater that the city supplies all the time soothes us, and we have each other to say, can you believe that, <laughs> or did you hear what she said, or something like that. So that's what I did. I set it up, and I wrote it out, and then I realized I had gold, that how I could solve my problem, my writing problem, was to alternate sections of the story in the past with these walks that I would make Mama and me take. And each walk would become self-sufficient. Each one would arrive at point. Each one would make more of a point about the two of us. And as I went on, well, what happened then is I rewrote everything I'd written up to that moment. And then I took it further. And as I went on, I realized the two sets of women, the people we were in the present and the people we'd been in the past, were slowly 
accounting for themselves to each other until we reach the end of the book. And that was, that's how I just, how, that's how I stumbled on and had the wit to make use of an, an odd structure that served me well. So it was a great, it was really a truly a great experience for me. And I do consider it rightly the end of apprenticeship. At the end of it, I thought I was a professional writer. <laughs> and what did your mother think about you writing oh, a book? Oh, my mother, <laughs> my benighted mother. <laughs> My mother was a character. Uh, she was um, a very childish woman in some ways uh, and a very volatile woman. So she ricocheted off many different moods. Um, when the book was published, she, the first thing she said was, you've told the truth. I'm amazed at what an effect I've had on your life. You have just told the truth. A week later, she called me up in a rage and said, <laughs> You have held me up to ridicule, now the whole world knows you hate me. <laughs> and a week after that, she went on. But after a while, I, I was telling Anne and some other people, the book had a, a lot of celebrity 30 years ago when it was published, and my mother walked around New York signing it. <laughs> like, and I said, Ma, you can't sign it, you didn't write it. And she said, well, without me, you didn't have a book. <laughs> so I couldn't. I couldn't deny her that. <laughs> yeah, she was quite right. <laughs> she was right in some odd way. <laughs> you can just imagine this, can't you? you can <laughs> she was uh, incorrigible. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you like to say that you do personal narrative? Yes. Uh, you talk about your mother. How is it to talk about someone that you know? How you mean? How is it to write about yeah, someone? Sorry, yeah. yeah, that's to what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Well, in, you know, every writer writes about the people they know. Mm -hmm. it, it's all you really have. Your personal, your the, the life you've lived, the experiences you've had, the people you've encountered. They are your raw material. Yeah, I've taught write. I've taught nonfiction writing for many, many years, and you have to you have to teach uh, students that two things primarily. One, your feelings are not a subject, right? Your feelings are not a subject. <laughs> and what you've actually lived through is just raw material. Those okay. two things, right? So what I say to a student is, your feelings are uh, an instrument of illumination. You use the feelings to speak of other things. And also, the raw material is there to be shaped. Without it, it's just confession, or it's just therapy on the page, or it's, but it's not literature, it's not writing. So what I call personal narrative is, you take this raw material and you have to make larger sense of it. Exactly the way a novelist who has an emotional insight, a flash of insight about something, and it is an emotional insight. It's not intellectual. It's not even necessarily spiritual, but it's a flash of insight about the, some truth of emotional life. Is the essence of stories, poems, uh, novels. Then, then the obligation is to shape it so that it speaks to some, it achieves metaphor. It speaks to something larger than its own pedestrian or homely elements. I have exactly the same obligation, so, when I write, whoever I'm writing about, I feel free because I trust my motives. I trust that I'm not going to use people badly. I'm not writing in order to score. I'm not writing in order to, um, you know, get revenge. I'm not writing for any of these wrong reasons. I'm not writing in order to make myself a victim or make myself um, a hero. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to use what I have lived through in ver a variety of ways to say something that will achieve literature, <laughs> that will shape a piece of, 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 of material so that it achieves metaphor. I believe that the nonfiction um, narrative can do that as well as fiction. So that's why I feel free to, now I feel free to write about anybody because I always feel it, it, all the things I've just told you. I trust my own motives. 
I trust that I'm, I'm, I'm writing in order to speak hard truths, but just to speak hard truths. Now, I've had the experience, the awful experience, of people recognizing themselves in something I've written and feeling bad, feeling really badly. But the truth of the matter is, more novelists get sued by their parents than memoirists. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth in, in New York publishing. Is it? Yes, absolutely. More, more parents um, can sort of demonstrate that their children are holding them up to ridicule or that their children are writing in, yes, yeah, more than memoirs. <laughs> so this, this is... The, the, the American writer jo Joan Didion, she once said, every writer sells everybody out. Uh, and and that, that is the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another writer I know once said, I write as though everyone was dead. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the best. <laughs> I think when writing, it's also important for you to have a point of view, something that you learned yes. when you were a journalist. As a journalist, yes. I started writing as a journalist. I wrote for many years for the Village Voice in New York, which, which many decades ago was a great counterculture cultural newspaper. Um, and I was on the barricades for radical feminism. So that was polemics. I was really writing polemics. Everywhere I looked, I saw sexism. And every time I went to a dinner party, it was sexist. I read a book, it was sexist. I went to the movies, it was sexist. And I came home and wrote a piece. <laughs> and, and that's what you call a polemical journalist, which has obvious, its obvious drawbacks, uh, but it also has virtues. And one of them is it really teaches you the strength of a point of view. And when I was ready to give up journalism, uh, the realization that a point of view was really the most powerful element that a writer had at her or his disposal, it stood me in good stead. So it was, it was great training, actually. When someone reads your book, your memoir especially, uh, or at least I had the, the impression that you were revealing so much, but this mustn't be true. I mean, I suppose you choose when to write and what to write, and maybe you need to be careful to not write when you're feeling really bad or something. Uh, I'm sorry, you'll have to repeat that. Yeah, I got lost in it. <laughs> when, when writing your books, yeah. the, the memoirs, yeah. I have the impression that, that you reveal a lot about your, your oh. life, about your, rela your relationship with your mother, but not only your mother, yeah. with your husband, for yeah. example. Right. And I don't know if you, if you try to be careful with that. No. I no? No. Okay. <laughs> not at all. No, no. Work is work is work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, 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 never. That really, truly was, was never. That decision was taken early. There were times, I, I shouldn't say never, sometimes my mother would interfere with me uh, while I was writing the book, and she was aware of it. Um, that was probably a big mistake on my part, ever to have told her what I was doing, because every now and then, she would rail at me and say, why are you writing this book? So the whole world, you know, that kind of thing. And then I'd get paralyzed for a couple of days, <laughs> and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to work uh, because she would paralyze me. But in fact, once I, once I returned to a sense of confidence uh, about the voice that was speaking and the narrator whom I had, had pulled out of myself, um, then I believed the story belonged to her and not to anybody else. And so, you, you know, if you don't get that far, you're not, you can't write, you're not a writer. And, and you just, you, people who worry a lot endlessly about uh, what the, you know, what, what can I, how can I write about this one or that one or the other one, they'll, they'll feel terrible. Um, if that dominates you, you, you're not a writer. I mean, it, it's, it's a choice that's made and, or even it's not a choice, it's a compulsion, it's, it's a, a drive. Uh, and if that drive is strong enough, then the rest of it just falls into place. <laughs> it's a compulsion, but I think that you define writing also as an agony. Yes, it is. Wow. It's the hardest thing in the world to think. There is nothing, digging ditches is nowhere near as hard as thinking. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, it's, I, I, I think, I'm sure there isn't a writer in the world who wouldn't say that.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some of them say that they enjoy writing. I know. Are they li- lying? They're lying. <laughs> <laughs> they're lying. I don't believe it. <laughs> I do not believe it. <laughs> um, you tell us a lot about your mother. Uh, she wanted you to be a teacher. Yes. Well, my mother. what happened? <laughs> right. My mother. Uh, <laughs> My mother was immigrant working class woman who believed that you send a daughter to college, she walks in one door marked college and comes out another one marked teacher. That's what a girl is supposed to do. Not because she thought a great deal about teaching, but she thought that I, of course, would be married. She thought a great deal about my becoming a wife and a mother, but that I should have a a trade, as she used to say, in case my husband left me or died or did some other awful thing (laughs) and I was forced to make a living. I should be a teacher. So I went to college and I majored in literature and became an English major. And when I got out of college, I wasn't a teacher, and she felt swindled. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that, was, that was those years. It was remarkable when I think back on it, how many of us, the children of this, this gen- we were the American-born children, first, uh, the, not first generation, second, but we were one of the, the last of the American-born children of immigrant parents. And they were eager to send their children to school in this America where you could, where you could send your children to school. But they had the dimmest notions, the absolutely dimmest notions of what followed, you know, of what it was all, it was, it was and so that we ended up sort of becoming the parents of our parents and explaining to them, which was very touching when you think back on it, or when I think back on it, um, My brother, for instance, was really very talented uh, in science and math and gained a place in a very uh, gifted school for gifted uh, boys. It was all boys, Bronx High School of Science. And when he got out of school, my father thought, my father who pressed dresses in a dress factory in in the garment district of New York all his life, he thought now his son would be able to become a salesman which right. <laughs> he wouldn't be standing in, uh, at an iron, uh, you know, with a wire up to the ceiling all his life. He, he wouldn't be sweating in a factory. He'd be wearing a white shirt, and he would be going out into the world uh, like that. And my brother had to explain to him that even though he wasn't a genius, he still had to go to college. <laughs> so, so it's it's a, and I'm sure that these are familiar stories here, right? I mean, they're very. Um, that's that's what I came from. Um, but as I've said to somebody else this afternoon, um, that was working class politics. Growing up in a left wing working class home, where the politics were very straightforward. It was a very straightforward notion of left and right. And then the liberationist movements that was so formative for me in the 1970s and 80s, sort of changed the definition of class. When we spoke of class, I'm sure this is familiar to all of you, you know, we all knew what we were talking about. We're talking about workers and capitalists. Well, after feminism, after feminism, gay rights, black rights, all the great civil rights movements of the 70s and 80s in, in America, my definition of class changed we began to think of all these, these minorities that I have just named as a new class. Uh, we, we called ourselves a new class of have-nots, those who have and those who have not. Those were very familiar terms. Um, and so we applied those terms to, to, these, to these elements, to women, gay. In other words, it was... It was just as good, if not better, a way of talking about the failed promises of the democracy, that which, which of course, Marxism and uh, and classical left-wing um, allegiances always allude to. What they're really talking about is the deprivation of human rights, um, and we said, now these are the deprivation of human rights you got to look at. 
and it was just as good. We, we, have, we have not benefited from the promises of the democracy. You know, we've been left out. We're the new have-nots. And I never was able to go back to the old concentration on, um, on class struggle. Um, but I still, I still um, feel very compelled by class struggle, only I have a di different definition of the classes. <laughs> I think, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry because I'm going to ask you about feminism. About feminism? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because she's so tired because she spent the whole day yesterday in Madrid Talking. with journalists and they all asked her about feminism. And today the same has happened. So she said, please, can't we not talk about that? But I said that but I couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but okay, just a little I bit. You, I forgive you. Yeah, no. sorry about that. It's okay. But they wouldn't forgive me if I, I know, wouldn't. I, so. I understand. Okay. I have you a live in New wave. York, they live here. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I, this also changed the way you saw, you saw things. Yes. And I think uh, you entered feminism because when you were at the Village Voice, they sent you interview someone, a feminist. They sent me, oh, oh, you mean what was the beginning yeah, for the, me? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, right. It was like 1970, 71, and um, I was just begun working at the Village Voice, and suddenly uh, one of the editors there uh, said he wanted me to go out and interview these, what he called them chicks, these liberationist chicks who were gathering in Greenwich Village. <laughs> <laughs> right. They were called liberationist chicks, and he wanted me to go out and uh, interview them and come back with the story. So I went out and I found um, a whole lot of women who subsequently became very famous in America. Um, Kate Millett, Susan Brown Miller, uh, Betty Friedan, all kinds of people who subsequently made big reputation, and not Gloria Steinem, but she, she was a little bit later. But it was a whole, whole lot of women who were um, suddenly spouting feminism. And I, like that, became a convert and came back and wrote a story called The Next Great Moment in History is Theirs. That piece became a classic, um, but it was really a piece of, of, of instant self-discovery. It was, it was an, a moment in which, and that was a moment which, and now we're having another one somewhat like it, but that was a moment which engulfed thousands of women, and I was one of them, and it was really a matter of temperamental response. What happened was enough was being said so that if you were temperamentally receptive, you suddenly saw it all, all at once. You saw yourself in history, you saw yourself in, in culture, in politics, in, in, in society, you saw yourself existentially, you saw the whole sweeping nature of divided human psyche, you saw why some people had to aggress and others be aggressed against, why some had to be up and some had to be down and some in and some out, and it was just an extraordinary thing. And all this you saw through the sudden grasp the really serious grasp of the deprivation of women's rights uh, that, that for centuries uh, we had all agreed to live in a culture in, women, in which women lived as second-class citizens, as uh, a subordinate creature. And it was remarkable. What was most remarkable about it was it was so strong an experience that most of us thought we were making an actual revolution we thought what we see today in our hundreds, others will see in their thousands tomorrow, and the day after that in their millions, and then it's all over. And it was, it was really, literally, I thought, you know, a couple of years, and uh, there'll be complete equality between men and women. <laughs> and here we are 50 years later. <laughs> um, and it's painful to realize that the term sexual harassment was coined 50 years ago in the 1970s. Um, and, and, in the, and the reason that you have so much rage now, so much anger among all so many young women and not so young women, um, is because so little progress has been made over all these years. 
There just has not been enough. Um, there's been great progress in many, many ways, many. You know, we wouldn't be here uh, at another time, even 30 years ago, 40s. We, we all, I mean, look at all the things that women do now that they n never could have dreamed of doing. You, just about to give birth, you would never be on a public stage 30 no. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many ways in which we've made huge progress, but there are so many ways in which we haven't. Um, so we didn't make a revolution, but what we did make was uh, a good start on social change, right? Mm -hmm. And it taught me, too, um, something that the old left understood pretty well, too, to take the long view, not to expect revolution tomorrow, but to, to, to believe that every small step finally accumulates into, into change. And the reason you believe in it is because you see that it doesn't go away. Right, it just doesn't go away. And, and that's all the proof you need that something vital is at work. The fact that, and that feminism, for instance, every 50 years since the French Revolution, it rises up again, makes a small amount of progress, dies away because it's very hard to accomplish, and then comes back again. The fact that it comes back again and again and again is all the proof you need that it, it has got finally to prevail. So we need to keep the faith. Yeah, right. You and I have to stay alive until, <laughs> until it does. <laughs> um, then you, you became a, a, a feminist journalist. Yes. Uh, feminism, uh, we can find it uh, when, when we read uh, your books everywhere. Yeah. I think uh, being a woman has always been the most important part of your identity. Not always, but finally, yes. Finally, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, not always. Um, as, uh, I, I, by the time I, I became a feminist, I was an, I was an expert at outsider uh, identities. Since we were the children of uh, working class, immigrants, Jewish, and then finally girls. <laughs> we were all of those things. And by the time I, I realized um, that, it, by the time I realized that being a woman was the most important part of it all, that in, in the United States, at any rate, the other parts of those identities that felt depriving, that could, could make me feel marginalized, that I stood at the edge of society rather than at, than at the center of it, they actually gave, they yielded as, you know, in other words, being born into an immigrant working class family, um, it was it was not a um, it was not a death sentence. It wasn't a prison sentence. It gave. It finally, in other words, I grew up and it didn't matter that much. I got educated, and I I left I left those those um, that early poverty. I was able to leave all that without any uh, stick any stigma attached to it. Um, and Jewish too. I mean, there was the the anti-Semitism that my parents experienced. I did not. And especially living in New York City, um, so those parts gave, you know, and that was strong enough to show me that, that being a girl did not give. There was no way to escape the sex into which I'd been born. The others were escapable, um, but but that was not. And when I came to understand that, that's of course that's that's the meaning of feminism. When you come to understand that, that there's just there's no escaping it. And you know, in the 1970s, many of us, we thought we were inventing all this. We thought we, we were the first people in the world to see all this. And it was, it was like a passion that arose, that arose out of original discovery. Then I began to read my own history, read the history of suffrage, of, of universal suffrage in America, and realized and came across the work of a great philosophical suffragist like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and realized they had said exactly what I was saying 100 years earlier. 100 years earlier, but exactly. And, though, and, and young women today are reading what I wrote 40 years ago. And uh, I mean, I run into that all the time now in New York. Oh, I read what you wrote for 40 years ago. Exactly what I <laughs> So that's good and it's bad, right? It's, um, so yes, I would say definitely. And when my mother was 80 years old, I convinced her that being a woman was the most important part of her 
Um, oh. her, yes, and that was hard going, but I did certainly convince her of that. How and, did you uh, do it? When I was a child, um, the Second World War was on, and my mother was, my mother hated being, my mother hated being a wife and mother. <laughs> she really hated it. She wanted to work like nobody's business. And when she'd been young, when my father married her, she was a working girl. And he was a working class man, but it was a shame to him that his wife should work. So he made her stop working. But she always hungered to go back to work, to really go to work. And she was good at it. You know, she, 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 she was a bookkeeper, and she loved working in an office. She loved getting on the subway and going downtown to work, and she loved it all. So the war was on, and, and, and there were thousands of jobs available. And one day, she couldn't stand it anymore. And she got on the subway, went downtown, and got a job. And she came home, and she sit and announced like a child, bursting with excitement, I got a job. And my father, he, he, it was a dinner. He stopped dead, and he said, uh, you can't work. The children, uh, the children need you. And uh, I, I piped up. I was this little kid. And I said, no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> We were so excited that she had gotten a job. And then he said, it's too much work at, in the house and you'll lose weight. I said, she could lose weight. She's overweight. <laughs> <laughs> so she went to work, but she couldn't bear it. He made her life miserable. And eight months later, she quit. When she was 80, I said to her, Ma, if it was now, and Papa said you couldn't work. She said, then she, she, um, she used a, a, a curse word I'm not going to use here, right? <laughs> she said, I tell him to go. <laughs> okay, we can imagine it. what yeah. follows. She said, I, I, would, I would tell him the hell with it. Yeah, she said, I would, I would tell him um, whatever it was. Yeah, she'd tell him, I, I would tell him to screw it. I could, I, and that she would do it. And I believed, of course, that she would, that she would have told him that she would not have told him off, but she would have said, I have to do this and I'm going to do it, and she would have prevailed. And I, think, and I think that would have been, and she knew it was the measure of the difference between her life and mine, that I didn't have to do anything like that or that I wouldn't do anything like that. I mean, in other words, not work because I was told not to. And, uh, so she came to understand that very well. And um, there were many of my friends whose, whose mothers refused to understand it. It really was always a matter of temperamental response. Um, so throughout all the years, it was Elizabeth Stanton, throughout all the years I've known that every real social revolution turns on the passion and the insistence of a relatively small group of people. Because the general, um, the, the general response to life is one of inertia. That is the, the condition that prevails the, the most strongly. You know, in other words, the, the resistance to change is stronger than any, other, it's, than any other impulse. It's remarkable what people are able to bear rather than, than, than face the fear of chaos, the fear of the disruption. Of, of, of things. Um, many, many writers have noticed the, as, as some have called it, the patience of the oppressed, the willingness to go on living with the status quo rather than risk the disruptions of, of, um, of social change. And it takes a burning passion on the part of um, a certain number of people to, to, um, to accomplish it. And feminism, and well, like all of the isms, I mean, all, all the struggle against racism, the struggle against homophobia, all of those have required that, and they got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because your mother, she wanted to work, she couldn't because her husband didn't want her to yeah, work. Yeah, because but her. She still told you that the most important thing for a girl is love. Yes. With a capital letter. Right. She said. Never forget the most important thing in a woman's life is love. And one day I came to her and I said, Ma, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you were wrong about that. <laughs> Every 
everyone who be- agrees with me, raise your hands. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> but you still married twice? I still married twice. Even if you weren't con- convinced <laughs> of marrying them? Um, no, afterwards I was convinced, right. Well, um, well you know, I, was, I, was, I, was, I, I actually believed until my second divorce that, um, that I had to be married. Okay. That was essentially it. Uh, I. Uh, uh, But I, I think that there are people who are, are uh, really just not fitted for, um, and I think I was one of them, that I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was not fitted for the condition. Um, you know, what is there to say? <laughs> when, I think, when, when you were young, uh, in Fierce Attachments, you say that uh, you explained how your mother and your neighbor, Nettie, they kind of taught you how to become a woman. Yes. And I think that what really was important for you was not to be pretty or to have a husband, but to be intelligent. As it turned out, <laughs> yes. Yeah. As, it, as it turned out, right. Yeah. How did you see that? How did you feel that? Like, how did I? Ma- yeah. How did I s- realize that? Um, yeah. That this was well, much I, more important see, I, that, than what they were telling you. I didn't. I didn't realize it. As most of us didn't realize it. The the um, the remarkable thing about the development of the women's movement is that it at. What is always remarkable is how the same thing seems to be occurring in thousands of people at the same time. And there's no really explaining that. Why suddenly a, th- a few thousand people at the same moment see their lives in the same light? And that's never re- that can never really be explained. But if you were there and you felt it and you responded, um, you were suddenly able to see things just like any other insight. You know, suddenly you see... Th- See things in a different, in a, in a light that, that opens your eyes to, um, to mixed feelings. What every one of us felt was mixed feelings. Not, not, not a single feminist, either then or probably later, but certainly not then, um, felt completely at her ease with those definitions of herself, but could not explain them. I mean, that's the whole meaning of a social, of, of political, of, of a political, dawning of a political awareness that you are suddenly given the sentences with which to clear up, with which to clarify a lot of uneasy feelings, just feeling uneasy in a certain situation or in a certain way, but not able to tell yourself why or what it, what it was all about. And it isn't really just a matter of, of these intimate relations, which are, which are the most acute in the matter of uh, women's second-class citizenship. Almost all of us knew perfectly decent men. My husband's wanted more for me than I wanted for myself. I never felt oppressed by anybody, more oppressed by myself than anything else. Um, so it was, it was just, the minute I got married, I, I, I got confused about how to act. I wasn't sure of how to act. So it, I, I brought most of it on myself, but of course I was bringing it on because of the world in which I was living. I didn't, I felt peculiar. I didn't know, did not know how to explain to myself. Well, th- those are the very things that political awareness turns on. The, what is the meaning of the unease that you feel about a life that you're embarking on? Um, uh, what it, for black people, uh, for a, ch- a black child in those years to reach the age of 12 or 13, as was said famously in the 60s, and suddenly see that they were black in the eyes of white people and know uh, all of a sudden uh, what, that this had something to do with the lives they were living is exactly the same thing. Or certainly gay, me- gay men and women to reach an age where they suddenly realize not realize, but feel they're freaks in the eyes of the world, the large world, and, and they, get, they get the message without being conscious of it that this is a feeling that has to be hidden. 
That's what political awareness turns on. And that's what happened to us. Why it happens when it happens was, is really a mystery. What are all the elements, all the whole collective uh, set of elements in the world around that are creating that moment, I don't think can be explained, or I, I can't explain it. I can only describe it. Um, but it's, it's, the, it's all of that. It's, it's, it's examining all those internal feelings of unease about something basic about your identity, like your sex or the color of your skin, or realizing in one way or another, go out into the world and realize in one way or another, because of one of these um, um, un unnegotiable elements of, of your identity, that you are consigned to a certain kind of life without recognizing um, the penalty that goes with it, without, without, or, or with recognizing it, but without understanding what it is. Um, and why at various moments in history that coalesces into revolutionary activity is really hard to understand. It's just as easy to see all of this feminist ferment now receding, going back, and people just um, going back into the easiest, falling back into the easiest positions on all these things, saying to themselves, it's natural for women to do this and it's natural for men to do that, instead of standing up and saying, no, it's not natural. It's, it's, it's made, these are cultural decisions that have declared these things natural. Can't be natural since I don't feel at ease with it. Um, so I don't know where I'm going with all this. <laughs> but you get the idea. <laughs> I'm going to take you to the Bronx now. Oh, the Bronx. How does that sound? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> better Sounds than better feminism? to you than to me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because you always lived in New York, but yes. uh, when you lived in, in the Bronx, yeah. you had this impression uh, to not belong in the city, like right. uh, being... You're right. Yeah? Yes. Can you tell us a little right. bit about that? Well, I'm sure most of you realize that New York City is made up of five boroughs, and the, the central one is Manhattan, and Manhattan is really New York in the eyes of the world, and it is. New, Manhattan is where everything happens. The boroughs that surround it are the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens, and they are almost entirely residential, and, um, and most of the neighborhoods in the, 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 the great mass of, of working class people who surround the city live in these boroughs. And I grew up in one of those neighborhoods. And, um, and they have various characters, but mostly they were, when I was a kid, they were working class neighborhoods. Um, and the city, Manhattan, was like Araby. It was like, uh, a ma and indeed it was. It was, it was the magical, uh, paradise that you would get to w when you grew up. Nobody ever intended to stay in the Bronx. <laughs> we all we all longed to escape. And for me, growing up in the Bronx, I might as well have been growing up in the middle of the country in Kansas or uh, or just I mean a any immigrant kid from any other part of the country uh, was like me except that I could um, take the subway downtown after I was 14 or so and walk the streets of the city, although I had to go back to the Bronx at night. And as others before me have said, many others have said, that trip that was taken from the Bronx to Manhattan was the longest subway ride in the world, <laughs> by which was meant, you know, you un understand what that means. It took a long, long time to get there. And it was, it was uh, where we wanted to go, and um, it became, it was the, the, the end of the, the pot of gold at the end of, of the uh, rainbow. Then, of course, getting there and seeing there was no pot, there was no rainbow and there was no pot of gold at the end of it was a whole different story. <laughs> that once you got there, you really had to work to make your way. <laughs> but, um, but New York has that, that mythic quality. It, it was able to, and it was able to um, transmit that quality to its own native-born children who were, but if you were growing up in the suburb, in, in, in the um, boroughs, you might just as well have been growing up in a village somewhere else in the country. 
-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was very interesting. It, it remains exactly the same. The same working class neighborhoods prevail to this day, just not us anymore. I once heard you say that the city has given you more comfort than any yes. person ever. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah, that is true. I once brought a dinner party to an end, practically, um, in, in Texas, when I was in Texas teaching, uh, because I said if everybody I knew died tomorrow, I'd still have New York City. <laughs> <laughs> And in a way, it's true. Um, <laughs> Did they have a sense of humor? No. No? Okay. <laughs> I scared them. <laughs> they got scared. <laughs> but in a way, it's true. I mean, in that um, the city is an endless source of renewable energy, and, and the pool of human possibility is so large, the feeling, not that you necessarily can replace people or shouldn't want to replace people, but, well, yes, but that you could, if, you know, if you had to, is very strong. And above all, the crowd on the street, which is the joy of every flaneur, of every walker in the, in the city, the crowd is so large, so vivid, so never-ending, um, at one and the same time, both so anonymous and so theatrical. People are acting out all the time, every minute. There's, there's, you're never alone on the street, and, and never more so than when you are alone. Um, so yes, the city means a lot to me, and I, I consider myself first and foremost a walker in the city, yes. And I've been very grateful for that. And I am hardly alone. There are now a few million people who, who feel as I do, and I was saying this too, New York now has a, an astonishing statistic 50% of all households in New York are single-person households. More people live alone than ever before in history. More people who never expected to live alone. Um, and that, that grows out of our politics. That goes out of, out of the 70s and the 80s, out of the liberationist movements, and certainly out of um, feminism. Is the women's rights movement is certainly responsible for having pushed back the age of uh, a first marriage. Uh, which is, you know, thousands of people marry much later now than they did before, um, and all of that. But it, what is most amazing is is that statistic. That statistic, how that has grown, um, that, that um, and that's a sign of our times. And the city is a great comfort for all those who are living alone. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for leaving this oh. comfort for a few days <laughs> and pay us a visit. And I know you don't want to leave New York uh, soon, but if you can come back someday, we would be glad to have you here. I'll think about it. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> wow, they're so sweet. <laughs> they mean it. They mean it. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs>